as the lead singer and primary creative force in Creedence Clearwater Revival, John Fogarty helped define rock and roll history. Both in his music career and outside of it, he's lived an eventful and remarkable life. So let's go up around the bend and discover the untold truth of John Fogarty. Through his work in Creedence Clearwater Revival and in his solo efforts, Fogarty has been one of the most prominent practitioners of swamp rock. That's a genre that combines hard rock with blues, folk, and various forms of music native to the Gulf Coast area of the American Southeast. Acting like a Louisiana boy is something Fogarty fully embraced, as he sang in a gritty, raspy voice with a strong twinge of a Bayou area accent on all of his songs, perhaps most famously on the CCR track Born on the Bayou. But while Fogarty obviously loves and appreciates swamp rock and all that it represents, he isn't from the area. In fact, he was born far away from the bayou, as he arrived in the world in 1945 in Berkeley, California. The Golden State is known for a lot of musical styles, and thanks to Fogarty, one of those is a genre more properly associated with another part of the country entirely. The Creedence Clearwater Revival song Fortunate Son is a blistering takedown of young men who use their money, power, and connections to avoid serving in combat during the Vietnam War. It was released around the peak of the conflict in 1969, and thanks to its enduring cultural appeal, it's frequently used in movies set in that era. Fogarty composed the song in just 20 minutes, as he was inspired by his distaste for the lavish 1968 wedding between Dwight Eisenhower's grandson and Richard Nixon's daughter, which contrasted sharply with the war's violence and the protests of the day. But in a way, Fogarty was also a bit of a fortunate son himself. Around the time that he received his draft notice, he went to an army recruiter and volunteered, hoping to be rewarded with a less dangerous assignment and he wound up with a job as a supply clerk in the U.S. Army Reserve. He went through training at Fort Bragg and was stationed at Fort Knox, serving stateside for about two years in total. As he told Goldmine Magazine in 1997, Luckily for me, I didn't have to go overseas or serve three years in the hardcore army. Fogarty's experience is hardly the same as draft dodging, but he was certainly spared the worst of the war's horrors. What a, what a, I just want to say what a great country we live in and God bless the men and women who protect us. In the late 60s and early 70s when rock bands typically favored short and punchy names, Fogarty fronted a group with a long-winded, vaguely pretentious mouthful of a name. The three words in Credence Clearwater Revival sounded like they were carefully chosen. Surely one would assume they must have some deeper meaning. When Saul Zantz of Fantasy Records signed the band, they were known as the Gollywogs, but Zantz hated that name. So he struck a deal. The band would come up with 10 new name possibilities, and he'd come up with another 10, and they'd find one that everybody agreed on. As guitarist Tom Fogarty recalled in the book Bad Moon Rising, some of the suggestions included Muddy Rabbit, Deep Bottle Blue, and Credence New Ball and the Ruby. His bandmates became obsessed with that last one, which was inspired by the real name of a friend of Tom's. Then they started surgically building a title, adding an E to turn Credence into Credence, thereby suggesting a creed, or a deeply held belief. And Clearwater was taken from an ad for Olympia Beer, which was produced from cool, clear water. Water, the natural element. Then John Fogarty put those two words together with Revival, as the band felt like they were getting a second win with their record deal, and the rest is history. Creedence Clearwater Revival wasn't just about that hard and fast, dirty rock and roll, as they also occasionally released pleasant little ditties that made for great sing-alongs. Case in point, the joyful and jaunty looking out my back door. According to CCR drummer Doug Clifford, John Fogarty wrote the song for his son, Josh, who was just three years old at the time of composition. Looking Out My Back Door describes in great detail a wacky, circus-like procession witnessed by the narrator while he, as the title indicates, looks out his back door. Among the sights to behold are a cartwheeling giant, musician elephants, 
flying spoons, and a magician creating illusions. And as it turns out, Fogarty was inspired by a very un-rock and roll source, Dr. Seuss's 1937 book, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. He knew his son would enjoy hearing his dad's voice coming out of the radio crooning some goofy lyrics. Despite the kid-friendly source material, the preponderance of weird events and magical creatures led many at the time to think the song actually celebrated mind-altering drugs. Vice President Spiro Agnew even publicly called out the psychedelic references that weren't quite there. In 1970, Creedence Clearwater Revival took the John Fogarty composition Travelin' Band all the way to number two on the pop chart. It was a fast and hard-rocking song with howling vocals that spoke to the contemporary rise of heavy metal, but also felt like a classic 50s rocker that someone like Little Richard could have recorded. That evocation was likely no accident, as Fogarty was a big fan of the flamboyant rock and roll pioneer. All those great early Little Richard songs like Tutti Frutti and Good Golly Miss Molly were recorded and released by Specialty Records, which signed the performer to an exploitative contract. The terms of that contract initially paid him $50 for the rights to songs with a half-cent royalty for each copy sold. Specialty controlled Good Golly Miss Molly, and in October 1971, the company felt that Travel and Band was such an egregious ripoff of the Little Richard song that it sued Fogarty for $500,000 for copyright infringement. Ultimately, though, the case was eventually dropped. John Fogarty's older brother, Tom, was also a member of Creedence Clearwater Revival. Both Fogarty's originally had their own separate Northern California rock bands, and after Tom's group Spiderweb and the Insects flopped, he joined John in the group that would eventually become CCR. Tom could sing and write songs, but John quickly emerged as the more dominant frontman and composer. Only one song that Tom wrote, Walk on the Water, made it onto CCR's first album. Frustrated by his lack of creative input as CCR rose to the top of the rock world, Tom left the band in 1971. Disputes over the control of CCR's music further drove a wedge between the brothers. John contributed some work to Tom's 1974 album Zephyr National, but they remained distant until the end. Tom died from complications of AIDS in 1990 at age 48 reportedly contracting the disease from a blood transfusion he received after a surgical procedure. Years later, John was able to come to terms with the relationship. In 2019, he told Ultimate Classic Rock, At some point, I made a point to myself of forgiving my brother. I just felt like I had to do that because he wasn't around for me to get to work it out with him. I tried, but he was so not connected to reality. Soon after Creedence Clearwater Revival disbanded in 1972, John Fogarty released a couple of solo albums, but neither sold well. Then in 1976, he put together the album Hoodoo, but its single You Got the Magic tanked. Asylum Records opted to shelve the album, and it's never been officially released. Fogarty had to deal with that personal failure while still dealing with lingering issues over what he felt were unfair deals with Saul Zentz and CCR's label Fantasy Records. Between 1975 and 1985, he didn't release any albums at all. He didn't start recording again until 1983, but then he abandoned an entire album because he thought it was subpar. Then, in 1985, he unleashed Centerfield, in which he worked out some demons. The songs Mr. Greed and Zance Can't Dance were both about Zance, although a slander lawsuit forced him to change the title of the latter to Vance Can't Dance. Nevertheless, the bitterness persisted. Fogarty didn't start playing his CCR songs live until 2004. A year later, he signed a new contract with, ironically enough, Fantasy Records. Zance was out of the picture by this point, as the label had been sold to Concord Music Group. Creedence Clearwater Revival's fifth album, Cosmos Factory, released in 1970, is full of some classic songs, but its title speaks to simmering band turmoil. CCR used to practice in a Berkeley, California warehouse, and the atmosphere there, along with how Fogarty made drummer Doug Cosmo Clifford relentlessly rehearse, made it feel like a factory. 
Fogarty was not only the leader of CCR's musical direction, he was also the manager, which may not have been the ideal situation. As Clifford told Louder Sound, John was brilliant at all the musical things, but he had no experience at managing, particularly at the level we were involved at. It was a critical mistake, and ultimately it broke up the band. After CCR split, Fogarty thought that his bandmates betrayed him because they'd sold their right to vote on band decisions, and thus control of the band, to Saul Zantz. While Fogarty and his former bandmates remained distant over the years, their lawyers didn't. In the 90s, Clifford and bassist Stu Cook toured as Creedence Clearwater Revisited. Fogarty sued in 1996, as he controlled the CCR name. The parties reached an agreement in 2001 wherein Clifford and Cook paid Fogarty a royalty for billing themselves by the new name. They stopped paying that fee in 2011 when Fogarty disparaged Revisited in interviews, which was a violation of the legal agreement that led to even more lawsuits. Fogarty came back in a big way with his chart-topping 1985 release, Centerfield. The album's title track is a nostalgic tune about baseball that soon became a standard played over the loudspeakers at major and minor league ballparks. The song was inspired by stories that Fogarty's father and older brothers told him about legendary ballplayers like Joe DiMaggio and Babe Ruth. As Fogarty recalled to MLB.com in 2010, when I was a little kid, there were no teams on the West Coast, so the idea of a major league team was really mythical to me. The players were heroes to me as long as I can remember. Because the San Francisco-born DiMaggio played center field, Fogarty came to believe that that position in Yankee Stadium was, quote, the most hallowed place in all of the universe. In 2010, Fogarty was recognized for his unique contribution to the national pastime as the National Baseball Hall of Fame honored Centerfield on the occasion of its 25th anniversary. Fogarty played live at the induction ceremony and also donated his custom bat-shaped guitar to the museum. When I originally wrote this song, it was basically an eight-year-old boy uh, saying thank you to baseball for all the joy and inspiration. Not only did John Fogarty resent Fantasy Records boss Saul Zantz, he also resented his former Creedence Clearwater Revival bandmates Stu Cook and Doug Clifford. That deep, long-standing animosity has prevented CCR from ever reuniting since their 1972 split. In fact, all four band members have played together again just once in 1980 at Tom Fogarty's wedding. In 1993, John Fogarty was given a chance to let bygones be bygones when incoming President Bill Clinton asked CCR to play at his inauguration. But Fogarty passed on the gig. As he recalled in his memoir, Fortunate Son, I said, I'm not playing as a band with Credence. I don't play with those guys. We will never play as a band again. John Fogarty is a man of his word, and CCR still hasn't played music together, though the surviving original members did all share a stage in 1993 when they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But when it came time for the customary performance for the newly inducted act, Fogarty played with rock legends Bruce Springsteen and Robbie Robertson instead, as he'd prevented Cook and Clifford from taking the stage. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite musicians are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.